Good afternoon and hello everyone. Welcome to today's event, the Business Continuity Institute Session 2, Creating a Business con con Continuity Plan, sponsored by the National Association of Community Health Centers. My name is Elizabeth Breidenbach. I'm a meeting and event specialist based in the Clinical Affairs Division here at NAC, and I'm pleased to bring you this event along with my division colleagues. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping announcements. You have joined this online event by either physically calling in or using computer audio. All attendee lines have been muted and will be muted for the duration of this event. The duration of this live event is approximately 90 minutes, including introductions, presentations, and Q&A. Again, the duration of this live event is approximately 90 minutes, including introductions, presentations, and Q&A. During today's session, uh, we, we will have the chat box open. The chat box is actually currently open right now, located in the lower right hand side of your computer screen. Simply type your comments, questions or concerns into this box at any time. Make sure you select the to everyone or to the to all panelists. Uh, so we make sure that we receive your questions. If we cannot answer your questions at the time allotted, we will make an attempt after the event has been completed. Again, chat box is open for the duration of this event open right now currently. Friendly reminders that today's event is being recorded. All attendee lines have been muted and will be muted for the duration of this event. The chat box is open and available for your comments, questions, or concerns. And after the event has been completed today, you'll be presented with a brief survey. This survey lets us know how we did, how valuable this event was to you, and directly informs us of future training and technical assistance. At this moment, I'm going to turn things over to Jervine Williams. She's the Director of Finance in the Training and Technical Assistance Division. Jervine, the floor is yours. Jervine just muted. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Liz. Well, welcome back to everyone who participated in the first webinar, and welcome to people that this is the first time they're attending. Um, first, I would like to go over our presenters today. Today, we're going to have Amanda Cooper and Nora O'Brien with Connect Consulting that has years and years of experience in business continuity and emergency management planning. Next slide. Before we get started, I just want to re reiterate how at NAC we try to put everything into the transformation framework based on the quadruple aim um, from IHI, improving the patient experience, improving health outcomes, reducing costs, and improving staff exp experience. So for this series, this falls into many different domains in our value transformation framework. Next slide. But we really want to um, stress the workforce and the leadership areas. Having a firm business continuity plan will definitely help with your workforce and with your leadership in navigating any kind of interruptions or things like that in your business. Another thing I would like to um, remind you guys, if you attend all three of the business continuity webinars, you will receive a certificate of completion that you can frame and put into your office. So if you attend all three sessions, you'll be able to get that certificate. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first presenter today, Amanda Cooper. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I participated in the last webinar. Um, Nora presented and I was kind of her backup. Um, so I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Amanda Cooper. I'm a planning specialist with Connect Consulting Services. Uh, I've been with Connect for about a year. Prior to that, I was a senior advisor um, with FEMA. So I traveled the country and US territories for about three years. Um, advising the heads of the disaster on inclusive emergency management and civil rights um, when it came to survivors and staff. Um, before that, I spent 10 years with the state of Alaska, where I was a planning section chief, as well as a public health emergency manager and a Americans with Disabilities Act advisor and consultant. Very happy to be here today. I have a passion for emergency management. Business continuity is a majority of the work I did with the state of Alaska. We did continuity of government, which is very similar. So I'm excited to share everything that I've learned today um, to help you guys dig a little bit deeper into how to develop your business continuity plan. So I am going to share my screen. And we will get started. Okay, so. 
if you were here for the previous um, session, um, we talked about in session one, it, we covered intro to business continuity planning. And during that training, just to ref as a refresher, we discussed what business continuity planning is, who should be involved in business continuity planning and developing your business continuity plan, um, the role of your board or executive directors when it comes to um, creating your business continuity plan. So today we're really going to build off of that. So today, uh, these are the following objectives that we're going to cover. Our main goal today is we really want to dig deep and provide you with all of the information and steps um, that you will need to either develop your business continuity plan or if you already have one developed, uh, revise your business continuity plan. So we're gonna give you the nitty gritty details. We're gonna detail and discuss uh, the key elements of a business continuity plan. So we'll go through those step by step. So you can, so, and we'll expand on each one of those key elements. So you get a good understanding of what that element is and what it involves and why it should be included in your plan. <clears throat> We will also discuss the process of using the multiple business continuity tools out there. Um, so when it comes to developing your business continuity plan, you don't need to start from scratch and create your own tools. There are so many tools that have been created throughout the lifespan of emergency management that will make the process much more seamless. It will make it quicker. And you will probably, when you use these tools, you're probably going to come across things that you never would have thought of. And that, those things, these tools have been developed over, like I said, the, the, since the 1970s, probably sooner, um, FEMA was, uh, FEMA um, was developed or um, the organization, the agency was created back in the 70s. So it's at least been going on since then. So you're gonna use those tools to really guide you in the process. So don't think that you have to start from scratch. I think that gets a lot of people <clears throat> caught up in the beginning is they don't know where to start. Well, today we're gonna to show you where to start and what tools to use. <clears throat> and then also we wanna provide you with a brief overview of cybersecurity plan for your health center. So part of business continuity is looking at um, the areas where you're vulnerable to a cybersecurity threat. So we thought we would just, throw, you know, not throw in, but we developed a series of slides that will help you start thinking about, okay, in terms of cybersecurity, what are some things I need to be thinking about should a disruption occur and we need to, um, we need to continue our operations. Um, so the disruption may be a cybersecurity attack. So we're just gonna give you kind of a brief overview of what you need to be thinking about and how to conduct a cyber cybersecurity impact analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is our agenda. First, we will identify and discuss the key elements that need to be included in a business continuity plan. And like I mentioned before, we'll go through those step by step and provide you additional detail and explanation of those components. Next, we're going to look at the different business continuity methods and tools that I mentioned before um, that you may use to develop your plan. Third, we'll provide you with an overview of cybersecurity planning for healthcare, like we mentioned before. And then, like I mentioned on the last slide, we'll review and discuss the process for conducting a cybersecurity impact analysis for your health center. So let's get started. So we wanna look at your key components um, of your business continuity plan. We're going to do that. So on this slide, you could see each of the key components are listed. These are all the things that will really build up and make a um, efficient and usable for your health center um, business continuity plan. There's no point in developing a plan that you won't use. So we really want to, when you're developing this plan and we go through these steps, start thinking about how you would tailor it to your health center to ensure that this is going to be a plan that you will use. It's not something that's just going to sit on a shelf. You know, you create and sit on a shelf because that happens a lot in emergency management. And our goal is to avoid that because it's just wasted work then. So we wanna make sure that this is usable for you. 
So we have an overview of the key components that should be included in plan for in your business continuity plan. While this may differ um, across health centers because health centers may offer different services um, than another health center. The overall methodology used in developing a business continuity plan consists of the key elements that you see on this page. <clears throat> so in the following slides, we'll expand on each of these components and provide you with um, necessary information to include these components in your plan. So let's get started with executive support. Okay, so here we have executive support. We want to make sure. Um, so, executive support, let's define that a little bit. That is the organization's senior management team. They are responsible for overseeing the, um, for overseeing the planning process. And that may include um, establishing policy by determining how the organization will manage and control identified risks. Allocating personnel, knowledgeable personnel, and sufficient financial resources to properly implement the business continuity plan. They will ensure that the business continuity plan is reviewed and approved at least annually, as well as after each exercise or real life event. We want, uh, they are responsible for ensuring employees are trained and aware of their roles in the implementation of the business continuity plan. This includes all staff that serve in delegated positions. We'll discuss delegation of authority um, a bit later in this presentation. Also, they're responsible for reviewing the business continuity plan testing program and testing the plan on a regular basis. And so, like I mentioned previously, this is accomplished by an annual or semi-annual exercise that um, that you that your health center can either create internally, or you can reach out to us, connect, or other um, agencies that kind of provide that that technical expertise when it comes to developing um, an exercise to test your plan and make sure it's working. And so also, too, to say is that on the testing side, just to add to that, this is Nora again from. Connect Consulting Services. Um, so it's a CMS, you know, you have an exercise requirement annually to do an exercise. Your exercise, the plan that you exercise can be your emergency plan, but also can be your business continuity plan. So mm -hmm. do know that um, you don't just to just have to plan your um, exercise, your emergency plan. You can also exercise your business continuity plan and still meet that CMS exercise requirement. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for that, Nora. Great, great input. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the second key component, which is your planning team. So the business continuity team is a group of various staff members that are responsible for leading the research and building the business continuity plan. So the business continuity team will review the finished plan with all the departments. Because again, you don't want to just plan um, for your health center overall. You really need to get down into each department or each area of your operation and um, develop your business continuity plan focused on just those functions. Um, and you also want to review, they will also review with the organization to ensure accuracy. And it's often the team that um, is responsible for maintaining and training, drilling, and reviewing and updating the completed plan. <clears throat> so your team should be comprised of staff members from various departments. You want a very well-rounded approach when you're developing this. So ideally, you should have one staff member representing each department of the organization. Um, your business continuity team may also be made up of an existing emergency preparedness committee if that's something that's already um, operational and standing within your health center. So you want to ensure that there are members that represent medical, clinical, and administrative functions, as well as health information technology, facility operations, finance and accounting, human resources, and other business units or departments within the organization. So if you're at a smaller health center, 
it may not be practical to have um, an, a member from each department. In this case, individuals from specific departments may be asked to attend specific meetings where their input is needed. So they may not have to participate in the entire process. So your planning team. First, you need an appointed a business continuity planning manager. And this manager is in, is has various responsibilities, including they develop and maintain a business recovery plan and procedure. They review, revise, and expand existing plans and protocols. They conduct risk assessments for various departments and functions. They analyze potential business impact of unpredictable business interruptions, such as natural disasters, a security breach, maybe a legal claim, um, and any other kind of disruption. They are responsible with their team of creating and facilitating exercises and drills to make sure that the plan is being executed appropriately. They also develop and provide staff training on risk management and disaster recovery. And they work with health, safety, and security staff and local, state, and federal agencies to ensure that they align the organization's emergency um, management plan or business continuity plan with the established best practices and community standards. That's very important. And just one more thing, this person needs to have a pretty thorough understanding of emergency management and risk management and business continuity. So next you wanna include a member from your executive team. We often refer to these individuals as a C-suite or um, member. So it can either be a member or it can be one of their designees. So the senior management individual with overall responsibility, or excuse me, the senior manager individual will have the overall responsibility and accountability. Um, Sorry, I lost my place for the business continuity program. So they're going to oversee everything that your business continuity planning team is doing, and they have to take accountability and responsibility to make sure that the team is on task, that they're meeting deadlines, and that they're developing a plan and testing a plan that's going to work for your health center. Next, we'll have our safety officer, and this individual should already have parts of the disaster plan or the um or your emergency response plan in place in terms of fire safety um theft prevention etc so now we want to talk about the other a member from each of the following departments so we have human resources the great thing about human resources and why it's so crucial to have them on your team is that they have ready access to up-to-date information about the individuals who are important to the plan, the individuals who play a key role in that plan. They are your go-to person if you need contact information, et cetera. So a member from public information, um, this could be a public information officer or someone that's been selected by your health center to be the face of your health center and, and to um, communicate with the public. So, your public information person, this is your voice to the outside world. This is the face that they're going to see um, when it comes to your health center. So this role is crucial in getting accurate information out to your patients, out to your vendors, and out to your public on kind of the status of your operations. Then we have finance. This, this person knows your vendors the best, they can provide insight on what, what kind of support the organization can expect while recovering. So they probably have some backup vendors. So if you're in a situation, let's say, you know, COVID, the pandemic that hit, and you can't get supplies, your primary vendor is out of masks, gloves, whatever those consumable medical supplies are, finance person may have backup vendors that they could, they could reach out to to see if they can get that needs um, filled. So they're a crucial part as well. And then you wanna have someone from legal. So your legal person and your legal team can provide important insight on the legal ramifications of activities performed into a response in, in response to an emergency. So they're gonna make sure that you're following all the, all the rules, 
the mandates and and legal requirements that you must do when you're responding to an emergency or when you're moving into business continuity. And last, you definitely want to make sure that you have someone from facilities or operations. Um, they can, this person can provide information on what um, mitigation steps and mitigate is to, you know, take steps beforehand to prevent and kind of mitigate the disaster, um, the negative impacts of the disaster. So they can provide those mitigation steps that are already in place for the facility, such as fire suppression, electrical services, your HVAC things, or your HVAC system, things of that nature. So each of these individuals, each of these members bring technical and advanced knowledge of their field. It's important to ensure that you have representatives from each of these fields as the business continuity plan will touch on each of these specialties. And if you feel so inclined, you may also add additional members to your team, including uh, maybe a representative if you have an emergency preparedness individual, emergency preparedness coordinator for your organization, or someone from IT, that could be really helpful. Um, and possibly if you have a risk management um, position, if you have someone in that position, they could also help. They would be a great help for this. Okay, next key component. And we're doing this in order of how this would lay out in your plan. Again, this is the typical order in the formatting of your plan, but you need to tailor it to what works for you. Okay, so vulner hazard vulnerability analysis. For me, this is one of my favorites. I think it's kind of a, I hate to say fun because you're you're planning for a disaster, but it's more of one of the interesting and intriguing um, elements and components to your business continuity plan. So let me define what a hazard vulnerability analysis or assessment is. It's a process for identifying your health center's highest vulnerabilities to natural, man-made, and technological hazards. And it also looks at the direct and indirect effect these hazards may have on the health center and the community. <coughs> Excuse me. So a hazard vulnerability assessment or analysis provides the health center with a basis for determining the most likely hazards and potential demands on emergency services and other resources that could occur during a crisis so that your health center um, um, can identify the effective preventative measure, measures that need to be taken and a coordinated disaster response plan can be developed. So during the HVA, team members conduct a risk assessment to identify and minimize key risks and threats that the health center may face and determine the steps necessary to minimize the impact and maintain operations. So the process may include identifying risks based on probability, history, impact, identifying any control weaknesses and or single points of failure, which could be, you know, if you find out that your IT security is not up to date, maybe your um, virus software has expired. And so that is, that's a control weakness, that's a point of failure. You also want to identify, um, mit identify mitigation and corrective measures that will eliminate, or excuse me, with estimated implementation costs, if possible, which could be implemented to mitigate the identified risks. Next, you'll select, implement, and document the most appropriate mitigation or corrective measures, and you'll ensure facility leadership and personnel are aware of the identified risks. This could be done through various methods. It could be by an educational uh, presentation, a summary report, or some other type of um, um, presentation that would get everybody up to speed. So when you're doing, I just wanna walk you through um, the steps of a hazard vulnerability and, and analysis. So um, when we've done analyses for other clients, what we do is we first look at the location of your health center. You wanna look at kind of the surrounding geographical area. Are you near a river? Are you near um, the ocean? Are you near um, any sort of nuclear 
um, uh, nuclear or, uh, business, um, a nuclear facility, excuse me, that's what I'm looking for. Um, for example, one of the, the um, clients that we had that I'm working on, they were, they were probably two miles uh, south of a nuclear facility. That comes into play when you're looking at your hazards. So once you kind of identify where your geographic location is and what those hazards are, then you can start looking at, okay, so we have this hazard that we need to plan for. We have this hazard. Are you in, um, are you in the south or are you in Tornado Alley? That's a risk that you need to mitigate. Um, and it's not only, it's not only those natural man-made or, or nuclear risk, it's also technology. Um, is your, like I said, is your virus software up to date? Is it working properly? Things of that nature. Um, and the best thing you can do when you start your HVA, look at, so counties and cities also are required to develop an HVA. So your best starting point is to look in where your health center is at, look at your local county or your local city or state. Um, I, going, going all the way to the state may be pushing it a little bit, but if you look at your local city and your local county, you should be able to categorize, uh, excuse me, not categorize, you should be able to locate the hazard vulnerability analysis assessment that the county has created and completed. That's going to give you a starting point of the threats that you need to minimize, those risks that are out there. So. Once you identify what those risks are, then you need to determine the impact that that would have on your business. And there is a great model out of there. Um, you know, there's tons of HVA models out there that are tools that'll help you and um, do this process and calculate your risk, um, your the risk percentage, the percentage of threat that you will have on your health center. The one that I recommend highly is. Um, Kaiser Permanente, um, I'm, I'm not sure if they're throughout the country, but they're definitely here in California. They have developed this tool that is used widely. And it's basically a spreadsheet and you go in and you enter the threats that you have in your area. You enter in how many times that your health center has either been on alert because of one of those threats or has, or you've, evacu or you've activated your emergency response plan because of one of those threats. And for each time that you've done either one of those, you, you give a point. And then you start looking at what is the impact to life and safety? And then on a scale of, um, they'll give you a scale of how high to rate it. What is the impact on your operations? What is the impact on your physical location? And once you put all of that data in there, it's going to calculate your percentage of risk. So then once you have those, um, that percentage of risk calculated for all of your, um, all of the threats that are relevant to your location, then you want to look at, you're only going to plan for, uh, I mean, it's great to have knowledge. Um, it's great to have knowledge of all the risks that you're, that you're at risk for. Um, but typically what's done is you want to develop specific mitigation and event specific response um, plans to the top three to five hazards that are identified. The ones that have in the top, um, that have the, the top five um, when it comes to percentage. So you want to identify those and those are the, the most likely threats that are going to affect your health center. So you want to make sure that you're developing mitigation strategies for those top five so that when it does in emergency management, we say not if, it's when. So when those things do occur, you you already have a mitigation strategy of how you're going to work around that disruption. So it's an um, it's important to note also that um, you excuse me um, health centers you should document and review your HVA every year and share it with your community. You know um, if. If you are really a hub for um, patient care in your community, post your, the, uh, the results of your HVA on your website. That way the community knows kind of what they're at risk for in this situation and they know, they'll know that you have plans to mitigate that so you can keep your doors open. Sure. So uh, one of the things to add is uh, it's a CMS requirement 
as well to complete the hazard vulnerability analysis. So, and this is an example where it's an, um, where your emergency operations plan and your business continuity plan need to reference each other because your HVA that Amanda has been going through this process is also a requirement for each of your health center sites. Let's say you're an organization that has 22 sites. You need to conduct a hazard vulnerability analysis for each for each site. Great. Sorry. Um, and just a final note, your HVA should be conducted annually um, to ensure that your health center is prepared for any changes due to climate or advances in technology, et cetera. So it's really important. And once you do the first one, um, the, the first one is kind of the heavy lift where you're getting into it and you're kind of figuring out how to do it. But an, after that, when you do it annually, it should be a much quicker process and everybody should be um, um, on board and kind of knowing what the steps are. All right, so let's move on to the next component, which is your business impact analysis. So, once your hazard vulnerability assessment is completed, um, you will move on to the business impact analysis. So we're going to shorten it, call it a BIA. A BIA is really a detailed study conducted by the BCT, BCP team of all the business processes within the organization, department by department. So each department's processes are then analyzed to give the team a complete picture of the health center's critical and non-critical um, operations. So the process may, may be divided into separate areas. So first, you're gonna have your critical processes. These are your essential functions that are important to the mission of your health center and must be maintained during an emergency event. So is it essential um, today to keep the business open? Are there functions that are legally required to continue? So an example that I can give you when I worked with the state of Alaska, um, the, the department, I was in the Department of Public Health and I was in the section of family health. So within family health, there was a, uh, there was legislation, there was a legal mandate that no matter what kind of disaster um, we were facing or what type of disruption, disruption, unless it was completely catastrophic, you know, um, they had to maintain and keep the newborn metabolic screening pro um, program going. So this was a screening process that, you know, that obviously screened newborns and looked for those, um, I hope I'm not speaking incorrectly, but looked for those kind of syndromes or genetic anomalies in newborns that could be fatal. So example, one of them was, um, it was a urine test and it, um, and it, they evaluated it to make sure that they didn't have a certain type of disorder that would be toxic for the newborns. I believe it was, I believe it's called maple syrup syndrome. I could be completely wrong. So all, all of you out there in the health world, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I just wanted to give you an example of something that had to be continued to protect the life and safety of the newborns that were being born within um, the state of Alaska. So that's that's a great um, that's a great example of an essential function. So an example for you guys of a critical process or essential function would be patient re registration or patient triage. So your non-critical processes play an important function in the organization, but they're not essential during an emergency event. So, um, and they're not essential to keep the business open. So an example of a non-critical process would be scheduling routine patient visits. Um, you know, that's something that you do day to day, but when a crisis and a disruption happens, that's not going to be a critical process for you. So during the um, business impact analysis, the critical processes are identified along with those dependencies that support that function. So when you have your essential function, you need to look at what dependencies are required to make that function function. Um, and you wanna look at that in terms of what are your staff dependencies? Who needs to be there? How many staff? Um, what schedule do they need to be on? You need to look at the stuff that's required. 
um, laptops? Um, do you need to use cellular phones? Do you need fax? Do you need video conferencing capabilities? Um, that's stuff. Then you go to your systems, email, um, uh, electronic health record. Those are going to be the systems that support your, your critical process or your essential function. And last, you want to look at the space. Um, where, what kind of space do you need to continue operating that essential function? So we look at it as the four S's of your dependencies, the staff, the stuff, the systems, and space. Once you identify that, then you start moving into um, identifying your recovery time. So your recovery time is the length of time that your critical process or your essential function um, can be down before it begins to affect health center operations. So for example, let's say um, your phone system went down or cell tower went down. How long can you function without that source of communication before it really starts to negatively impact your essential function? I would assume it's rather quickly. And um, what we'll go through a little bit later is we're gonna look at a timeline. Um, and so usually when we're talking about a recovery time, we do it in stages. So first there's a zero to two hours, two to four hours, and so on. And that's the amount of maximum amount of time that that function can be down before you guys um, start to have major issues. Then we're gonna look at a business impact score. So you're gonna look at those essential functions, you're gonna look at your dependencies, you're gonna look at your recovery time, and you're gonna think, okay, how significant is this disruption on our business? Um, so you're gonna rate that from a scale of one to three, one being low, three being high. So loss of communication, that's gonna be a high impact on your business. Um, so you'll rate each essential function, you'll give them each a recovery time, you'll fill in the dependencies for each essential function, and you'll give it a score of how negatively, it, how significantly impacts um, your business operations. So as I mentioned before, one of your essential business functions is likely patient triage. So patient triage is a critical process and it's dependent on staff, your triage staff, Stuff is your medical supplies, systems, any electronic equipment you use to do triage, such as like a blood pressure monitor um, or, you know, um, the O2 um, measure that you put on the finger, the pul uh, oximeter, pulse oximeter, um, and then your space, which would be the room in which you conduct your triage. So your recovery time for that would be rather short. You would probably stick um, anywhere from zero to four hours. And that really depends um, on how um, busy your health center is and how often you're getting patients in that do need some sort of triage. Um, and then your impact score would be moderate to high, depending on how much triage, like I mentioned, your health center does on a regular basis. So something else to know is triage may also be something that needs to be searched. Um, during an emergency or, or um, a response, um, if you um, end up having more patients that come in that need that type of service. So once you've completed your business impact analysis, you'll wanna provide a summary of how you completed the analysis as well as the results um, to your um, senior leadership. Um, and so also it's important to provide to your staff so they kind of know you know, what we're looking at, what our essential functions are, how quickly do we have to have them up and running, um, what, what dependencies, what tools, what staff, um, what space and systems that we need to make sure that we're up and running again. So now we're gonna move on to, you've done your business impact analysis, you've identified those critical processes, which are your essential business functions, and you've identified or you've realized you need to start developing some mitigation strategies um, in case that function goes down. So mitigation strategy. Um, this is where you get to get creative and I think it's really fun, but of course, like I mentioned, I'm kind of an emergency management person, so it may not be as fun for you, but I think it's really exciting. Um, so once you've completed your BIA, 
for all your departments within your health center, as well as your business impact analysis summary. You, you will see where you should protect your business assets uh, to prevent or minimize downtime during a disruption. So the business continuity team should look at creating mitigation strategies, procedures, protection, and backups for the health center, such as um, an, in, an internal and external structure reinforced at the physical site. You want to ensure that your fire detection and suppression systems are current and operable. You want to develop redundant third party support. So let's say, um, let's say it's, cat it's not catastrophic, but it's enough that it's, um, the dis this disruption is enough that it's going to decrease the number of staff that are available um, to, to work at your health center. So a third party support could be a temp agency. So you want to make sure that you have those relationships developed so that in this kind of situation where you have a bunch of staff that aren't able to come to work, you have another pot of staff to draw from. And you want to develop backup systems and procedures for your computers and software. So mitigation can also be kind of defined as, you know, if you have a process or a system that goes down, you need, what are those manual workarounds that you could develop to ensure that you can still perform your essential functions even without the, the technological piece of it? So as I mentioned before, you'll develop mitigation strategies for your top three to five um, identified risks or threats that you um, identified in your hazard vulnerability analysis. And these strategies can be incorporated into either a separate mitigation plan or included in your emergency operations plan and business continuity plan. So these strategies, here, I'm going to give you some an example of some mitigation strategies. So procedures to incorporate appropriate inventory of critical equipment. Do you have a backup method to do that if I if technology is down? Um, another strategy would be um, to maintain adequate supplies of water, non-perishable food, items, batteries, medical supplies. Do you have an emergency kit within your health center that has all of those supplies that you're going to need? So if, if, it's, if it's a big um, disruption, you may not be able to run out to the store if you run out of batteries. So having that emergency kit is a, is a, a mitigation strategy. Um, developing off-site backup systems for your data, your critical software and your facilities. Do you use the cloud? Um, you know, if something's going down and the physical um, technology that you have within your health center is not working appropriately, your, your strategy could be that you also use a, a web-based storage system so that you can still pull that data down. Um, and you want to develop disruption alternatives for key essential utilities. Um, so if your power goes down, flashlights are great. Don't recommend the use of candles. I know people want to do that, but it just creates a bigger fire hazard. Do you have emergency lighting? Do you have a backup generator? Um, communications, do you have, um, so if the regular phone system goes down, are your cellular phones working? Do you have sat satellite phones in case you need to communicate when um, cellular phones aren't working? Your data and records and available and the, um, um, the recovery of information. Do you have paper files as a backup? Um, or is everything stored in the electronic health record? Do you back that up? Do you back up that medical data to where you can access it without use of the internet? Um, your facility, do you have an alternate location identified? If something happens and your health center has to shut down, but your work is still needed in the community, is there another site that you could, you could re um, station your staff at to still see patients during this time. And staffing, like I mentioned, um, alternate staffing plans, um, pulling from maybe another health center that wasn't affected as yours, or using a temp agency. So it's also helpful to develop a mitigation policy for your health center to identify and guide the strategies for accomplishing these activities. So this policy should outline the importance of mitigation as well as the health center's commitment to furthering it, and include a list of mitigation 
um, strategies, the party responsible, the person responsible for overseeing its completion, and a time frame for completion. All right, so we're, we're moving on through. We've got our mitigation strategies. Now we want to talk a little bit about recovery. How are we going to, re what is our recovery strategy from this disruption? So during a disruption, your health center will need to respond quickly and efficiently as possible to maintain your operations. However, there are disruptions that will force the health center to maintain just your critical processes, which are, are your essential functions, um, and those practices that will maintain an income flow to your organization. Procedures should be in place prior to an event, that's where we get around the preparedness, which identify your essential functions, your mitigation measures, and your response and recovery actions to take. So recovery strategies are developed for the top three to five identified risks that we talked about from the HBA. These can be incorporated into a separate recovery strategy plan, or it can be included in your business continuity plan or your emergency operations plan. Um, since we're talking about business continuity, you kind of want these strategies within your business continuity plan. So these strategies can determine or may include determining how long an essential function or a critical process can be down before it impacts your operations. Again, that is your recovery time. You want to identify your recovery strategies and courses of action. So. Now that we've gotten into, okay, the, the bulk of the disruption is over, we need to move into recovery now. You need to identify how you're going to do that. Develop, you know, you can put a procedure in, step by step, but we do this first, then this, then this, and it's just um, a numerical process of how you get back to normal operations, because that's always the goal, is to restore your normal operations as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, you also need to determine and document reimbursement and cost for any of the mitigation strategies you, you implemented. So, for example, if you had to use an alternate site, um, you need to look at um, kind of the cost and reimbursement possibilities for that site. Um, an example would be, you know, is there FEMA funds out there? Are you in a location? Um, are you in a county? that was declared um, federally declared a disaster. So if you are, there's so many resources out there to you after a disaster. I know I've worked with all of them. Um, FEMA, not always, but FEMA can come in and really help you offset a lot of those costs. So in general, the disruptions to your business will fall into one or more of the following categories, facility, equipment, staff, and technology. And again, the four S's, your staff, your systems, which could be your equipment, your um, space your is your facility, and your um, staff stuff system space. Um, and or sorry, your stuff is your equipment and your um, systems is your technology. So procedures can be developed for different disruptions and should cover almost every situation that your business may encounter. Again, we talked about the top three to five. So what you can develop, and this is something that's included in the business continuity kind of guide um, that we developed for um, NAT. Um, there's, you can develop a disruption action plan that will allow you to respond and recover from an event as effectively and efficiently as possible. And uh, an example of that template will be, is included in that plan. So it's also helpful um, when, you're, when you're looking at recovery and you're looking at mitigation to inventory all the equipment that you have at your health center. Now, this is really important to do before a disruption occurs. Um, you, because this information is required to make service calls quickly in the event of a disruption. So you wanna look at your equipment. You want to write down and list the type of equipment and its location. The serial number or the, the key, the license, identification uh, numbers for the equipment. You want to identify and write down the vendor or the manufacturer. Um, if there's a warranty, and if so, the warranty expiration date. Um, the company name and contact information for your vendors. And any additional information that would be relevant during a disaster. 
All right, so let's move on to training drills and maintenance. So part of business continuity planning must be a commitment to sustain the work the team has done. It's crucial. And this should be incorporated into a policy. So you can develop a training drill and maintenance policy um, with your organization that works alongside um, your business continuity plan. So within um, the policy, you would want to identify um, the, the business continuity planning team who's responsible for sustaining the business continuity plan after it's completed. Um, again, this should include a senior leader or a champion who can assist when necessary to maintain those business continuity efforts. You want to um, identify who is responsible and how frequently the plan should be reviewed. So what events, you know, a drill, an actual disruption, things of that nature would trigger a review of all or part of the plan outside of your normal annual review schedule. <clears throat> you wanna identify how staff will be trained on the plan, including the frequency of training, who's responsible for overseeing the training, and, and which staff will be trained on which topics. You also lastly want to identify how staff will be drilled on the plan, including the frequency of drills. For an example, a fire drill, um, who's responsible for overseeing the drill and which staff will participate in the drills. <clears throat> it's critical that during the development of your business continuity plan, the business continuity team set dates, times and topics for business continuity trainings, drills, and team meetings to review the plan. This will ensure that it can be incorporated into the normal schedule of operations at your health center. Also, by making this part of the actual business continuity plan um, that senior leadership will approve will help to ensure their commitment to sustaining the work of the team. So teams should track all changes to the business continuity plan. Health center, your health center can choose a method that works for you. However, I'm going to provide you with two example or two suggested methods. So one, maintaining a revision page within the business continuity plan that lists changes and updates. It should include a description of the change, the date of the change, and the person making the change. Another way is to, at the bottom of each policy and at the bottom of your business continuity plan, you want to insert um, a, a some text at the bottom that is titled last updated and record the date of the last revision. So again, you also um, want to make sure that you're determining and documenting reimbursement and cost recovery strategies. That's really important to keep track of those as you're going along um, in a disruption um, so that you don't have to reach back after the disruption, um, after recovery to try to remember what those are. So training, drills, and maintenance, um, the BC, um, the business continuity plan must be maintained and annually reviewed. Strategies to do this include designating a person in the facility who is responsible and how frequently the frequency, the, how frequently the plan should be reviewed. Determining how staff will be trained on the plan, including the frequency of training, who is responsible for overseeing the training, things of that nature. And you want to determine how the plan will be incorporated into the drills and exercises and how frequency it'll be tested. Frequency will be tested. So next I want to move into, um, we're going to do a little poll. So here we go. We have this question. Um, does your health center have um, a business continuity plan? So by either using responding about, um, at the top of the screen, you can respond at the website, polleb.com slash Amanda Cooper 855, or you can text Amanda Cooper um, 855 to 22333 once to join, and then select A, B, C, or D. So I'm going to give you a minute. To see if we start getting any responses. There we go. We got a couple. Give you guys just a minute more because I know it's a little difficult to get in there. Amanda, could you um, 
give us the your name again, Amanda Cooper at eight is it eight five three? Eight five five. So either text Thank or you. yeah. Um it's Amanda Cooper eight five five is all one word. If you're going to text it. There we go. Oh, okay. Well, it looks like it's if you if you want to continue to answer this after I move on, that's completely fine. What I can do is um, I can send um, out a summary, um, or I can send out the PowerPoint that has the results in here. But right now, it's looking like we're split. So half of you, yes, you have you you do your health center has a business continuity plan, and you've seen it. Or, and the other half is no. Um, you either are not aware that it exists or you're pretty confident that it doesn't exist. So that really gives us a good starting point <clears throat> in kind of where our health centers are at when it comes to business continuity planning. And business continuity is not an intuit, it is not an intuitive um, um, thing that you think about. You really um, most people don't know about it until they're educated about it. So that's why these sessions are so important to get you guys up to speed so that um, when it comes to your business continuity planning, you kind of know where you're at and uh, you know where you need to be going. Oh, we just had some changes. All right, so it looks like 25% or 20%. Um, yes, you have a, a plan, but you haven't seen it. Okay, now we're getting some data in. So you can kind of see how it's shaken out. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Next, we're gonna be talking about the biz, our business continuity, our business continuity tools. There we go. Uh, let's see, okay. So these are the tool, I'm gonna cover um, some methods and tools that you, it's, it's, it will be very helpful for you to use when you're developing your business continuity plan. And this is what I mentioned before. You don't have to recreate the wheel. Already Use already what's out there and it'll make the process so much easier for you and enjoyable. Okay, so our business continuity tools, uh, methods. So we're gonna start with the methods. So the business continuity planning team may use one of three methods to complete the business impact analysis. So remember our business impact analysis is looking at our essential functions, our dependencies, our recovery time, and our impact score. So the traditional method, which, um, which this one um, can be, it can be short, it can be easy, or you can expand it a little bit. I've used all of these methods with our clients um, so it really just, uh, it, what will determine the method that you want to use really comes down to the time you have to invest in it. Um, and um, generally these don't take a lot of, um, there's not a lot of cost involved. So really you just need to look at the time and availability of your staff. So your traditional method is the most common method and it's the most formal method of conducting the business imp impact analysis. Um, so, um, each department will complete a business impact analysis worksheet that will include and review um, and designation of your essential business functions, your dependencies, your recovery time, and may reach into um, kind of your, your solutions, your business continuity planning solutions, which could be those mitigation strategies. So a member of the business continuity planning team will then interview each department individually to validate the information that was put in the worksheet and to assist with further, further developing your solutions, your mitigation strategies. The results will then be used to complete um, uh, the business impact analysis and the business continuity plan. You can also use a combination of methods. A combination of approaches may be useful and more effective for your facility to initially develop and or update your business continuity plan. And then the group method. So this is the method that I have done in my career most often. Um, so rather than individual interviewers, um, you bring together the key people from each department 
um, for example, um, you know, nursing for you guys, you want to bring the key people that are knowledgeable of all the um, ins and outs of that department and how it operates. So we bring those people into workshops and we complete the business impact analysis worksheet with them. So we walk them through the process. We, we remind them of what an essential function is. We remind them of what, the, of, of what a dependency is, of what a recovery time is and an impact score. And we're there with them live to provide that technical assistance as we're walking through the process. So um, this, may, this method can also save time and provide more details with the group thinking together. All right, the next tool that we're going to look at is delegation of authority. So a manager alone cannot perform all the tasks assigned to them. We know that, especially during a crisis situation. So in, so in order to meet the needs of where you're at in the disruption, the manager should be able to delegate authority. So delegation of authority allows certain duties of one individual or one position to be divided up and assigned or delegated to multiple individuals. So um, if your responsibility is answering phones and doing um, you know, administrative work, um, and for some reason you need to be pulled for something else, you can delegate that authority to multiple other people within your health center. So the elements of delegation. So first we have authority. So in the context of a business organization, your health center, authority can be defined as the power and the right of a person to use and allocate resource, resources efficiently, um, to take decisions and to give others or to give orders so as to achieve the objectives. Authority must be very well defined. It cannot be vague because if it's vague, then you run, you could run into problems of people thinking they have authority over something and not. Um, all people who have authority should know what the scope of their authority is, and they should not um, misutilize it. Authority is the right to give commands, orders, and get things done. The top-level management has the greatest authority. So authority always flows from top to bottom. That's something that's important to remember. It explains how a superior gets work done from his subordinates by clearly explaining what is expected of them and how they should go about it. Authority should be accompanied, accompanied with an equal amount of responsibility. Just because you have authority doesn't mean you have the responsibility. Um, it must, some people may think that they go hand in hand. So delegating authority um, to someone else doesn't imply that you're escaping accountability. Just because you delegate it, you're still responsible as well. Um, accountability will still rest with the person having the utmost authority. So responsibility, it's the duty of the person to complete the task assigned to them. So a person who's given the responsibility should ensure that they accomplish the tasks assigned. Um, if the tasks for which they were held responsible are not completed, then they need to, um, they should not give explanations or excuses. Responsibility without adequate authority leads to discontent and dissatisfac dissatisfaction. So responsibility flows from bottom to top. The middle level, level and lower level, lower level management holds more responsibility. So then we want to talk about accountability. So that means giving explanations for any variance in the actual performance from the expectations that are set. Accountability cannot be delegated. For example, if person A is given a task with sufficient authority, and person A delegates this task to person B and asks them to ensure that the task is done well, responsibility will rest with person B, but accountability still rests with person A. So for achieving delegation, a manager who has to work in a system um, that performs the following steps. So assignment of tasks and duties, granting of authority, and response and creating responsibility and accountability. So if we look at this chart, we want to see this is just an example. So under authority, this is the authority authority that is granted to the, the one of the, one of three individuals listed over here on the right. So the authority is to close and evacuate the facility um, 
And what is what will trigger that? These are your triggering conditions. So you will close and evacuate the facility when conditions make coming to or remaining in the facility unsafe. And so the person that ultimately holds that authority and that responsibility and accountability is the chief executive officer for this example. It may be someone else in your health center. But you can see here on the last column, if the chief executive officer needs to delegate those authorities, oh, excuse me, let me go back to previous page, um, delegates this authority first to the incident commander, um, and then so on. If the incident commander is not available or they have too much going on on their plate, then these are alternate delegates for that. So just to note, um, delegation of authority should not be confused with orders of succession. So orders of succession are different in that they allow one person to take on all the duties of the person that they are replacing. Whereas delegations authority, again, like I mentioned, divvy up those responsibilities. So next tool that we'll look at is a staffing analysis. So department leadership um, for each department should also complete a staffing analysis. This can be used as a starting point to ensure operations and minimize the impact of a disaster on departmental operations. So these determinations should be made with input from all relevant, relevant departments, as well as human resources and legal. So if we look at this chart, as you'll see, we've identified the main positions within a health center. The positions you include should be based on your critical processes essential functions. If a position isn't responsible for an essential function, you may choose to include them in the staffing analysis or not. Next, you'll identify whether a position can work remotely or not, whether it's remote work or telework. As you can see, most administrative positions can't maybe be able to be conducted remotely, but when it comes to direct patient care, those positions, certain positions cannot perform their essential services remotely. For example, nursing. If you're working in direct patient care, you cannot perform that work from an alternate location. So when you're thinking about the sunny sky times, when there's no disaster, normal operations, um, you'll want to list the number of full-time staff that you have on a daily basis. So that's that's in this fourth column, your full-time employees required during normal conditions. Next, you'll think about your health center's critical processes, essential functions. What you determine to be your critical processes will dictate how many full-time staff are required during a crisis. And last, you'll identify the position and the number of full-time employees that may be available um, for reassignment during a crisis. So if you have, um, you know, for example, one of your administrative staff, if um, they can be, if the work they're doing is not crucial at that moment, they can be reassigned to support direct patient care, whether that's um, taking notes during, um, during the health center visit or um, finding other for or for filing, so finding other avenues where you can we where you can reassign your staff to support the mission. All right. Next, we're going to go on to essential business functions. These are your critical processes. So here, this is just a way that you um, can look at them. So you want to determine what department those functions are that they the, that they are a part of. You want to identify the essential function. So, for example, finance, one of their essential functions is payroll. And then this is where we're looking at the maximum time that that essential function can be down. That's your recovery time. So, for example, um, payroll, you may be able to have payroll down for 48 hours. You may need to get it up and running sooner. But this is going to give you a list of how quickly you need to get all of your essential functions up and running. So, um, and we'll discuss this in more detail on this next slide. So we're talking maximum tolerable downtime um, is synonymous with, um, you know, how long your how long that function can be down. 
So to perform your mission critical services, your essential functions, the department depends on the following internal and external dependencies or needs. So if you look over here, one of our essential functions is, let's say, um, electronic medical record orders lab results. One of your dependencies is going to be a stuff dependency, and that's your computer. The d department responsible for ensuring that the computers are up and running and going is your IT department. So what happens if um, your if for some reason you can't get the computer um, up and running? So these are your manual workarounds. So the actions you'll take if the dependency is unavailable. So you'll implement a downtime procedure. You may not have that, you may develop it, um, or you may have to switch to doing everything um, via paper. And then it'll list the maximum tolerable downtime here um, is two to 12 hours. So lights, for example, the essential function of lights, that has a much quicker um, downtime, you need to have lights to you to operate your, your health center. So your uh, manual workarounds could be using flashlights, opening curtains, or having a backup generator. So this is just a good table that gives you examples of you what essential functions are and how to mitigate them. Bio break. All right, now we're going to move on to essential equipment and supplies. So again, you want to determine um, why you're doing your business impact analysis. You need to document your essential equipment and supplies. This will require you to document the status of major equipment or critical supplies, both on hand and in use, and how long they can operate without a present supply of vital uh, consumable materials. You also want to take inventory of your current equipment and supplies and create a resupply list. You want to check the condition of storage or on site stockpiles to determine the level of damage to equipment and goods after an incident occurs. So, again, this is just a good example of how you can list your essential equipment and supplies. Next, we want to look at essential vital records. So, again, you want to look at what a vital records here are the most important for you and you need to identify how, which, which version or what kind of copy you have of them and the location so that when you're in a business continuity situation, you have a quick and easy um, table to look at to know where to um, gather that information. And um, last, we're going to do our vendor contact list. So again, this here will list the services that um, need to be that need to continue during um, a disruption, who the company or vendor is for those services, and then here you'll enter the point of contact, emergency phone number. Do you have an emergency contract in place with them, and how quickly? Again, you need to get that up and running. And now we're gonna talk about um, the phases of reconstitution. So we're gonna talk about recovery. So recovery is resorming normal operations in the primary operating space. So there are four phases of reconstitution. One is you re-enter the physical space and ensure the safety. You reopen the physical space, replenish supplies and equipment. Next, you will repatriate patients if the patient care area is ready to go. And last, you'll resume normal operations, normal care and service delivery. So I want to give you a little background before I move into the next slide. We're going to, I'm going to tell you a quick health center story of how a health center that is very near and dear to my heart um, used business continuity. So like I mentioned, I lived in the state of Alaska for 10 years before coming to um, California. So there was a project up in the Yukon Kuskokwim Health in Alaska. That's a very um, centrally located location of Alaska. It's sort of near Fairbanks. It's a really cold um, region and um, co communities are spread far and wide. So um, once um, the staff at Yukon Kuskokwim Health were given a date for when they would receive the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines, they had to figure out a plan to get them to their patients in the rural parts of Alaska. So just to note, only 40% of the state is accessible by road, and most villages are only accessible by plane or boat. So you really, there's a lot of logistics that goes into that. 
So due to the time of the year, they also face challenges of winter weather and mountainous terrain. So they developed a business continuity plan that used small planes, amphibious vehicles, snowmobiles, what they call snow machines in Alaska, and a small team to meet the patients where they were. So one of the physicians, this is a physician quote, on our first airplane trip, the vaccine froze in the metal part of the needle when I was vaccinating on the tarmac, and I had to keep it warm by tucking it between my coat and my shirt until right before we gave the vaccine. When we planned on meeting patients where they were, we meant it. We vaccinated people on snow machines, in their vehicles, on four wheelers, in airplane hangars um, or airplanes in negative 20 degree weather, in village clinics, and in their homes. So you can see over on this left side or the right side here that they're vaccinating someone that's actually on a snow machine. Um, so due to the rural location, they were only provided with a month supply of vaccines at a time. So it was imperative that none of those vaccines go to waste and it became a race against the virus. So they named this project Project Togo after the hardiest Husky in the 1925 sled mush to Nome, which is now known as the Iditarod. The Husky, believe it or not, ran 350 miles of the 1,150 mile trek from Seward, Alaska to Nome, Alaska on the Bering Sea. So that is a great story of how they got creative and they pulled together in their business continuity plan and made sure that their staff were getting or their patients were getting vaccinated. So I know we're running low on time, so I'm gonna move rather quickly through this next section. Um, but it's, it's still really important. So let's talk about cybersecurity for healthcare. So um, this is another aspect of business continuity planning. So in today's electronic world, cybersecurity in healthcare and protecting information is vital for the normal op functioning of organizations. Many healthcare organizations have various types of specialized information, such as electronic health, re electronic health record systems, um, E-prescribing systems, practice management support systems, um, radiology systems, and computerized physician order entry systems. So these are things that, um, that all relate to cybersecurity. So historically, the healthcare field experiences significant breaches um, with malicious criminals responsible for most of the incidents. So some of these sectors are more appealing to cyber criminals because they collect financial and medical data, but all businesses that use networks can be targeted for customer data, corporate espionage, or consumer attacks. So the threat of cyber attacks continues to grow with the numbers of data breaches increasing annually. So when we talk about that, um, let's do an overview of cybersecurity next. So cybersecurity is the practice of defending computers, servers, mobile devices, electronic health systems um, in a variety of contexts um, for business to mobile computing and can be divided into a few common categories. So here we've listed all of the categories. The network security is the practice of securing a computer network from intruders. Application security focuses on keeping software and devices free of threats. Information security protects the integrity and privacy of data, both in storage and in transit. And operational security includes the processes and decisions for handling and protecting assets. So safe practices um, that have been put into place from um, certain organizations. So email is the primary method of communication within healthcare organizations where all kinds of information is created, received, sent, and maintained within those systems. Um, phishing can be a top threat. The most significant incidences are caused by phishing. So unwitting users, so unwitting staff, may knowingly, unknowingly click on a malicious link or open a malicious attachment with a phishing email and infect their computer systems with malware. In certain circumstances, that um, malware may spread via computers. So you wanna make sure that you're protecting from those types of things. Also, healthcare centers can take actionable steps to mitigate cybersecurity attacks on email, including defining um, policies and procedure, procedures for employees to use um, your, in, your information technologies, 
conduct information and cybersecurity awareness trainings and workshops to educate employees about phishing scams, spyware, and identi identity theft during initial hire and on an annual basis. Um, you can also require employees and staff to utilize strong passwords for networks and systems. You can implement multiple authentic authentication um, methods for computers and networks, and you can establish procedures prohibiting the transmittal of protected health information. So, in order to conduct a cybersecurity analysis, it's the tool that answers these questions. So, what information assets may be affected by a cybersecurity attack? What are the current and relevant threats? To health centers, what are the internal and external vulnerabilities to a cybersecurity attack? What cybersecurity attacks could affect the ability for the health center to function? And what is the level of risk that you are comfortable taking? So, the first step is you want to define your informational value. Um, and you'll do that by asking the following questions. Will your health center face any financial or legal pen penalties if information is exposed or lost? So think of HIPAA violations. Um, there's, a mo there's a monetary um, penalty for HIPAA violations. Um, how valuable is this information to outsiders? How can they use protected information to gain money and control? If this information is lost, how easily could it be recreated from scratch and how much? Money and how long would that take? Would this loss or leak of information negatively impact your health center's revenue or profitability? Um, and if information is lost, would your day to day operations be impacted? So these are things to keep in mind. Step two, you want to look at, you want to take inventory of your systems and resources and identify and pr prioritize your critical systems and assets. So during this um, step, you'll want to document every device, including computers, tablets, routers, printers, servers, and phones on the health center's network. Um, you also want to document how each type of those devices are used and how they connect. You want to make a list of those departments and individuals with access to each of those devices and systems, as well as vendors that assist you with the network resources. You don't want to, and you also do not forget to document network resources that are not physically located at your health center. Again, if you have data stored in the cloud. Next, we're going to identify threats to cybersecurity. While most common threats to cybersecurity include hackers, malware, and IT security risks, there are other threats to keep in mind. Natural disasters. So, disasters such as fires and floods can destroy information as much as any cyber attack. Um, system failure. Does your health center's critical systems run on high quality equipment? Are those systems supported adequately? And human error. Does your health center have proper training and education around malware, phishing, and social engineering? Next, we're going to identify your vulnerabilities. Um, a vulnerability is a weakness that can be exploited by a threat with the intention of breaching security. Um, email, smartphones, and other connected devices are the most significant potential weaknesses in most businesses. Knowing how and where cyber attacks can come into your system and how it processes or how it works um, can help you better understand how to spot a potential threat. And once you've identified the threats facing your health center, you will need to assess their impact. So here you set five, you want to develop a set of controls. So you want to set up a firewall. You want to create strong passwords. Um, you want to use multi-factor authentication, or you can use vendor risk management software. These are just examples of controls that you can use. And then last, you want to develop a cybersecurity action plan. So you want to work with a vendor, or you can use tools that can assist in detecting threats. And just to give you an idea of how bad these threats are, a whopping 3,800 data breaches were publicly disclosed during the first six months of 2019. And in 2020, 37 million records were compromised. So it doesn't take a lot. If you're not prepared for a cybersecurity attack, it doesn't take a lot. So you wanna make sure that um, you're conducting annual an annual cybersecurity risk analysis, and you wanna make sure that you're testing your plan um, annually or semi-annual basis. 
So that is the end of our creating a business continuity plan. I'm going to pass it back over to Jervin to talk about this resource that I referenced during our, um, excuse me, during the presentation. So. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was great. So um, we do have um, the business continuity booklet, which has all this information in a much deeper dive and plus tools and templates and policies. Um, that you can use that in order to either update or start your business continuity plan. We are pretty much close to time. We might go over about five minutes to answer Q and A. Um, the first thing um, I just put into the I mean, put into the chat a link to the Kaiser tool that Amanda spoke about earlier to, earlier in this session, and then we'll go ahead into the Q and A. Okay, so Nora and Amanda, the first question I have is. Do you recommend addressing specific vulnerabilities, e.g. fire, tornadoes or flood, or categories of vulnerabilities, e.g. physical damage or building damage? Um, I think that, that's an excellent question, first off. And I think mm -hmm. that really the answer is it goes back to you need to identify the top five threats that are, that are associated with your health center. So the top five could be natural disasters or they could be all man-made or technological. You want to, when you're doing your hazard vulnerability assessment, you want to cover everything that could possibly happen in the area of your health center, but you really only need to define those strategies for the top three to five. So yes, you need to look at them individually rather than categorically. Okay, and how do you think the business continuity plan will change post COVID? BCPs have historically been designed for relatively short emergencies and long-term recovery. Exactly. So I don't think anybody expected this pandemic to last as long as it did. I mean, Nora and I at least knew coming from my public health background, this wasn't going to, COVID wasn't going to be over quick. But so now what you can do is within your business continuity plan, you should also, in, alongside that, you should also have a pandemic response plan. And that pandemic response plan will tie in with your business continuity plan. Um, so business continuity plans, if you're looking at one of your top risks is a pandemic, um, it's going, it could be a much longer plan. There's a lot of things that you'll, uh, and a lot of moving features that you're gonna have to add in. And hopefully throughout this pandemic, you've been documenting all the changes are the workarounds that you've had to make in order to keep your health center operational. So those are the pieces that you wanna add into your business continuity plan. So the difference between a business continuity plan and let's say a pandemic response plan, pandemic response plan is only about how are you responding as an organization as a whole to that pandemic? What are the changes you're making in your operations to, to work through the pandemic? And then, goes hand in hand is your business continuity plan. How are you going to maintain business operations during response to this pandemic or during um, during any disruption? So they really work hand in hand. They will they should refer um, quite often back and forth to each other. Um, but I would expect that the bulk of what you're going to be doing in a pandemic would be in your pandemic response plan. Um, but would be addressed somewhat within your business continuity plan. Okay. So next question, how should organizations factor in individual sites such that shut down as they create a business continuity plan? I can answer that. Um, this is Nora again. Um, what's important to know is because health center sites, um, think about each of your site as an asset. So you have personnel, you have um, supplies, you have, um, you know, you have stuff, essentially your medical supplies, et cetera, uh, pharmaceuticals, and think of each of those as an asset in disaster. So what we've often seen, what health centers have done is moved operations. Let's say we saw during wildfires in the past where um, if they had 10 sites, they maybe moved operations to seven or eight sites and move those personnel to, um, uh, you know, several other sites so that you really kind of focus your energies on the things that are the most important. And so that's part of your continuity plan of figuring out your alternate, alternate staffing pattern, alternate um, sites, 
uh, where you're going to serve. And also the other thing to think about that, make sure that if you many, many health centers have um, mobile units, make sure that you include that mobile unit as a huge asset as part of your business continuity plan. What we've seen um, uh, health centers do in order, let's say their buildings damage is if they could, they could stand, you know, use that mobile unit and put it in the parking lot of the health center or a church parking lot and still could be able to continue to serve your patients. So, uh, but great question. Okay. Next question. Does this accompany a COO, COOP plan template or other business continuity plan templates that we can implement? Is there a multi month slash year plan that you suggest following to get this plan in place? Yes, so part, um, so the document that we created the business continuity kind of planning guide. At the end of um, walking you through everything that I just covered, um, there are some templates um, for each one of those components listed in the appendices. Um, and so, Nor, did you want to expand on that one a little bit? Um, yeah, so yeah, so the, the tools, what we did, we created this, um, this institute um, follows the same process of the business continuity template that we've developed. So you'll be receiving that. Um, and if you have any questions, we really encourage you to reach out to NAC, reach out to us and see what we can do. Also, you've got wonderful PCA staff that are knowledgeable about um, business continuity planning and lived in and breathed emergency management for a lot of years. Um, there's the uh, piece, the EMAC group, which is the primary care um, um, emergency compact folks that um, can um, support your business continuity planning pro process. And also check in with your healthcare coalitions in your state and in your communities. Well, Nora and Amanda, thanks so much. I put a link to the um, COOP, which is a con continuity of operations plan template from FEMA into the chat as well. And with that, that is the end of our webinar for this afternoon. Thank you guys so much for joining and please join us for the final um, webinar series uh, for the business continuity and thanks for all you do. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Bye.